Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm joined by Tony Dwyer from Canaccord Genuity, who's going to talk about the macro environment. I tell you what, there's plenty of movement. There's so much happening today with, uh, with, different, uh, with different asset classes. Our, our cup runneth over with, uh, with themes to talk about. But overall, you have a morning showing uh, a bit of renewed strength, a bounce after yesterday's uh, distribution, but accelerating to the downside into the close. What does this mean as we breach 4550. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the market activity using charts. And I've, I will always tell you that it's a good time to look at charts, but particularly now when you have a lot of movements, you have a lot of the potential inflection points, a lot of support levels, a lot of potential pullbacks coming into play. A chart used appropriately can be a very good risk management tool. I was learning about technical analysis in 2000, 2001. I saw the tech bubble, uh, which had been just resilient for years, unwind very quickly. 9-11, all of that happened in the first couple of years as I'm learning how to do technical analysis. And I was taught that technical analysis was all about risk management because that's why it was so helpful at that time. The people that I knew that I worked with that survived that period and thrived during that period were watching charts closely and recognized when we had rotated from a pattern of accumulation to distribution. And I think those ways of describing the market can often be very, very helpful. And I, and I would ask you, when you look at certain charts, when you look at the chart of Facebook or uh, um, certain banks, or if you look at Disney, is that telling you uh, that we are in a period of accumulation or distribution? That show you that it's more risk on or more risk off. Let's talk about some of the particular levels, though, that you want to keep in mind, what I call the line in the sand for, uh, for a lot of those particular charts. We're going to get to a lot of uh, great things uh, on the show today, including my guest, Tony Dwyer. We have great guests on the show uh, especially this week. It's been a really solid week. We have Tony here in a few moments. Tomorrow, we have Mark Chaikin from Chaikin Analytics joining us once again on the show. Next week, Mark Newton from, uh, from Fundstrat joining us. And on Wednesday the 8th, Gary Dean uh, coming back on the show from Sentiment Timing. Also, as a reminder, our holiday special on StockCharts.com is live all through the month of December. You can save a great deal uh, renewing your stock charts membership or getting a new membership. And if you've thought about subscribing to stock charts as a premium member, this is a really good time to do so. Better features, better capabilities, and so many ways to customize your analysis of the markets. Go to stockcharts.com slash special for more info on that, uh, on that holiday special event through the month of December. Let's continue on with our market recap. Boy, the day looked a certain way uh, in the morning uh, session, uh, Eastern time, and then completely changed. And as I was chatting with Tony Dwyer before the show started, I'm watching just the line go further and further down on the, uh, the two-day S&P preview chart. The S&P finishing below 45.50, and that, that's a key one, in my opinion. That takes the S&P below its 50-day moving average. Now, it's worth noting what we talked about on the show yesterday, about 40% of the S&P 500 in the last two weeks had been above its 50-day moving average and now have rotated below. So 40% of the S&P have broken the 50-day, but the S&P had not done so. Now you're actually getting the S&P below the 50-day, below the lows uh, from, uh, from earlier in the, uh, 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 below the, uh, the September high, which we'll talk about here in a, in a moment uh, as well, but certainly showing some distribution into the close. The NASDAQ accelerating a little further, mid caps and small caps also underperforming the S&P. So this is very much a risk off feel. And if you look, only one of the 11 S&P sectors finished higher. It's utilities, which is about as defensive as you can get uh, within the equity universe, I would argue. Utes, healthcare, consumer staples, the top three performing sectors, which is very much a risk off sort of feel. The VIX above 30. This is now the highest rating in the VIX that we've had since uh, you know, in quite some time, uh, reading above uh, 30, really 20 to 25 has been sort of the unofficial ceiling for volatility for the VIX in uh, 2021. We're, uh, we're eclipsing that, which feels like very much a different uh, volatility regime. If you missed my conversation, by the way, with Sean McLaughlin, 
of All Star Charts. He's their chief option strategist. We had him on the show yesterday. We're talking about the iron condor strategy and how to think about elevated volatility with a bit of a range bound S and P 500. But we talked a lot about the chart of the VIX, and I would go and check that out if you uh, if you missed it. But certainly, elevated volatility seems to be the story. Uh, right now. 10-year yields coming off, and you had uh, the 10-year approaching 150 earlier in the day, but actually the dollar sign TNX closing the uh, the day just around 143, 144. Uh, the short end of the curve coming up a little bit, the dollar index uh, up a bit as well, about a quarter of a percent using the UUP. Other asset classes, very few things showing any green, but gold was one of them with the GLD up 0.4%. Again, more of a defensive feel to that, uh, to that list of uh, things as well. Cryptocurrency is quite a move, and, and cryptocurrencies have really become a bit of a, you know, uh, very much a risk on uh, sort of asset class, right? It's, a, it's an area of a great deal of speculation, a great deal of volatility. And it's worth noting that at the end of the day, as you saw stock prices selling off, you also saw, saw sell offs in uh, cryptocurrencies with Bitcoin going back below zero to uh, touch 59,000 earlier today, closing the day or, or uh, currently trading just below 57,000. So quite a drawdown just from where we had accelerated up to earlier in today. Same thing with Ether, which had been up around 4750, closing uh, or ending the, uh, the uh, equity trading session around 4550. Let us look at the chart of the S&P 500. This is a chart we review most days on the show. And uh, yesterday, as we were talking about on the show, we had reached this pink shaded area. I tend to not think about support and resistance levels as levels. If you read a lot of the early texts on technical analysis, they talk about very particular price points and making sure that you're implying a precision of making sure you test certain price points. You have to remember when those were written, a lot of stocks were trading on eighths or something pretty uh, pretty, uh, pretty minimal, right? And so at most you have 12 and a half cents between, uh, between each trade. And so as a result, you could assume a very specific support or resistance level. And I think that made sense. Now, given the volatility, given the market structure, given decimalization and sub-decimal uh, trading for uh, uh, or sub-penny trading for uh, for most stocks, uh, you know it's unreasonable to expect a precise level. So I tend to think of things in terms of support and resistance ranges. So this pink shaded area is right about where we were in early September. That also lines up with where we broke out here in late October, and that was a great indication of further upside potential. We stalled around 4,700, 4,750, and I've rotated back below that pink shaded area. So we've talked many times about 4,550. I mentioned if we got below 4550, you will hear me take a more cautious tone and start to talk about further downside potential. We're here. We've now we've now reached that point. So let's talk about a couple of things that I would say. Number two, number one, anytime you reach a key support level, uh, there are a couple of things I, I would suggest. Number one, the first step is closing through the level. And earlier in the day when we were trading below the 50 day, uh, as I saw the line go down, my thought is, all right, we need to wait for the close. Because a lot of times you'll break a, a level, buyers will come in and push the close back above the support level. And at that point, it's not really been uh, you know, broken. It's it's holding, actually. It's a sign that the support level is almost validating that support level. You didn't see that here. You actually saw a close through support. The next thing would be what I call a follow through day, some sort of validation, some sort of confirmation that this wasn't just a fluke, that you see, that you see further uh, movement to the downside, further indication that investors are getting defensive. That's where tomorrow, Friday session become uh, very important to see if you get that follow through to the downside. It's worth noting that last Friday, with that sell-off, my market trend model on the short-term basis had turned negative. The medium-term and long-term model is still positive. A lot more deterioration. You start to look at the model and see if other uh, other time frames start to trigger. So what now? Given we do get the close below, which we did, given we do get follow-through or validation uh, in Thursday and Friday session, the next level I'll be looking at is 4,300 for a couple of reasons. Number one, that is the low from September and uh, early October. That was after a 6% pullback from the September peak to where we bottomed out there a couple of times. That's a pretty tried and true support level. And I'll be looking there. That also lines up beautifully with the 200 day moving average. And I think that's a decent downside potential all in. That's what, like an eight Eight or nine percent drawdown from the from the peak around forty seven fifty or so. I'm doing that in my head, but I think it's about right, which would be a pretty significant drawdown. That'd be the biggest pullback in 2021. Still, not even the average pullback. You usually expect about a ten percent uh, pullback during the course of a, of a normal year. We haven't even had that, so maybe this is that time where we uh, where we have it. 
is that possible? Absolutely. Is it is it likely? I would say, given the weakness that I'm seeing in a lot of individual equity charts, and we're going to do a deep dive later in today's show on the communication services sector. We'll look at some of the charts like Disney and Discovery and Comcast and others that are breaking down. Is there potential of the market going down another you know, 5%? Absolutely. That would actually be very easy to accomplish given the weakness that you're seeing there. The question though is how you manage the how you manage the downside risk and think about those different scenarios. We are in, for the most part, so it's the seasonally strongest part of the year. November into December tends to be pretty strong. There's a thing called the Santa Claus rally, which usually materializes in the uh, in the second half of the month. So there's a lot of, uh, of seasonal trend tendencies that would suggest that you're going to see strength uh, in, in December. Uh, you know, maybe this is the weaker part uh, in the first half of the month, and they set up for some strength going higher. But for me, given we get a validation of the of the breakdown, 4,300 is the next downside uh, look I would be paying attention to. On a sector basis, you know, I was talking with Julius De Kempner uh, earlier this week, and you know, when you look at the rotation, uh, you know, the most compelling rotations, I mean, the most encouraging patterns, I would argue, besides things like energy that have had good runs and decent pullbacks, it's something like uh, technology, right? And if you look on the RRG, you've seen this nice clockwise rotation indicating that uh, that it's uh, there's some strength there. Now, in the tech sector, you see plenty of stocks that are breaking down. I, I'm not struggling to find names that are breaking support in tech, but I'm also not struggling to find things that are working. Charts like Apple come to mind. Semiconductors, obviously, you know, testing are very near to all time highs and uh, and and showing resilient strength. Uh, as the market is actually uh, struggling. So certainly when I'm looking at opportunities, I'm looking at things like technology that are showing strength, despite the fact that overall you're seeing some market weakness. We have so many things we could touch on. We need to take a break though, and we'll continue this conversation after the break with my guest, Tony Dwyer. We'll see you in a minute. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's great to have you join us every weekday after the close as we focus on the market dynamics using the power of stock charts, using data visualization techniques to understand investor psychology. A couple of quick comments before we get to my guest today, Tony Dwyer. First off, we love to hear from you. Feedback on your host, feedback on our guests, feedback on our shows, all very welcome, but we especially appreciate your questions. What are you running into as you are trying to apply technical analysis in your own investment decision making? You can email us your questions at the final bar at stockcharts.com. You can hit us on Twitter, tag us in a comment at final bar SCTV. We're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our stock charts channel. We'll capture all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live on the show on Friday. Also, go to stockchartstv.com. That is our on demand platform. Great guest appearances like Tony Dwyer, Sean McLaughlin, many others. Uh, special series like The Pitch, our year in review coming up in December, so much more, all for free on demand. Go to stockchartstv.com or on your mobile device, just search on any of the app stores for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest joining us on the show once again, Tony Dwyer. Tony's the chief strategist at uh, Canaccord Genuity coming to us from the New York area. Tony, good to see you. Welcome back. Oh, it's great to be here, Dave. Thanks for having me. So we have so much to talk about, and then we have five minutes to try to touch on these themes, but it's been an eventful, uh, you know, less than a week. We've seen quite a, a change of sorts. Start us, uh, you know, uh, giving us the big picture point of view. How are you digesting what you're seeing here? So, Dave, I think it's the most important thing that I can talk about, and I, I love the human nature component of technical analysis. It's all human nature, and I don't think economics are any different. The chart that you have in front of you, given the, we'll call it the Powell pivot, Remember, it was uh, the Bernanke pivot and then the Yellen pivot. Now it's the Powell pivot, right? It's, it's what happens every time at this point in the cycle. But what this chart shows you is the long-term market-based U.S. inflation expectations. And what's interesting is even though it shows 2.52%, here uh, in, on this chart, it actually declined today down to one, uh, 2.41%. So while Fed Chair Powell is talking more aggressively about inflation and becoming more hawkish, the long-term inflation break-evens are coming down hard. And that's mm. basically telling me 
that the, the economic cycle can continue, that inflation isn't doing anything it did differently. And when you look at this chart in 2011 or 2004, this is this is the initial fear of inflation coming off of a massive liquidity move, monetary move after a debt fueled recession. Next chart. And and another factor that we like to look at, we, we see that inflation expectations are somewhat anchored and coming down actually over the last couple of weeks. This is the chart of the real Fed funds rate. And very simply put, when this red line is going up, it's tightening. When the red line is going down, it's high accommodation. The only recessions you've had is when there is an aggressive move higher in this red line. While the Fed may be type tapering and even tapering more aggressively, they're not changing the zero Fed policy until at least at some point next year. I frankly don't think they're going to do it at all next year. And that means that you're going to be in a negative real rate environment without a big up move in this for some time to come. Next one, Dave. Okay, this is my favorite. Everybody's getting on TV and talking about how the yield curve, remember why we use the yield curve, Dave? When the line is going down where you see those red arrows, it's when the yield curve inverts. The yield curve measures what a bank gets their money at and what they invest or lend it at. When it's going down and collapsing below the zero line, it means that banks would lose money to lend it. Why would they ever do that? Right. We're doing the opposite today. So a lot of people are talking about long term interest rates and the long duration yield curve. When that line's going up, it means that the, econ the economic outlook is pretty sound. So we have somewhat anchored inflation expectations an ultra easy Fed, a steepening yield curve and long term interest rates may have actually seen the peak for the cycle. If you look at the next chart. This chart is the 10-year note yield. This one, Dave, blew me away when I, when I discovered it. Those black arrows show you the peak of the 10-year note yield for each economic cycle going back to the 1980s. Please note, despite growth in all sorts of growth environments and all those cycles, the initial move out of the recession proved to not just be the peak for the cycle, but peak for the rest of time since then. What if, what if, Dave, 1.74% looks to be the peak. The highest we got with a 4% core inflation rate on the PCE, the, the, the highest we got with four, over trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of stimulus was 1.74%. What happens when there's no supply chain constraints? What happens when there's no fiscal and monetary stimulus and we're just left with normal economic activity? So... The outlook still, as difficult as it feels on, on weeks like we've had, the outlook for the, remember, the market goes, correlates to the direction of earnings. That's driven by economic activity, and that's driven by these charts. And that still looks okay. So the long-term picture certainly uh, structurally seems fairly sound. And, and of course, that's we're comparing that thesis with what we're seeing in the markets today. So how do you think between now going into into early 2022 where where are you looking opportunistically is is a, is an, a, a moment like this when you're starting to see a little more defensive uh, sectors working just a little bit is this a time to just sort of uh, wait and see is this time to get more defensive or is this a time to reset and and get ready for the next leg higher how do you approach something like this dave i i think that the calls that you you and i did this were you were my client and we've done this for a long time when everything's falling apart, people like me usually run for the hills. I stick with the data, right? Like, you know, the, the old line I love is corrections are only considered natural, normal, and healthy until you're actually in one. We're famous for calling for them before they happen. When they happen, it feels different somehow. Remember, this correction over the course of the last few days has literally been because of a new variant that nobody knew about. Then it was because of the Fed policy. Then it's because of the variant that somehow nobody assumed would get into the U. No. It's because the market got too exuberant. It got too high. In early November, we had talked about how when everything looks so great is not the time to chase. We're in, we're in the opposite now. So even if you were to get defensive, I would rather do it on a bounce mm. than to do it right here into a puke. That's exactly right, right? And, and as, as things are distributing, that's usually not the great time to be, uh, to be making that sort of move. Listen, Tony, it's awesome to have you on as always. You, I've, I've always been so thankful about how you take things that seem difficult to get your head around and you make them seem incredibly easy and people should know how much you've worked to, to make that seem as easy as it does. But listen, thanks for uh, sharing some expertise with us today.
Thank you so much, Dave. Have a great day. That's Tony Dwyer. Tony's the chief market strategist at Canaccord Genuity in New York. And again, I've you know I've known Tony for a number of years, and uh, and I really appreciate. It. I I've always thought of him as a technically friendly friendly uh, strategist, right? Meaning he is not a technical analyst, but he is one of the non technical analysts that I would have on the show anytime because he does a great job of relating what he's seeing and relating activities of the Fed and what we're seeing with uh, with investor behavior and how that relates to the charts. And I and I, I hope. Getting a window into uh, into Tony's perspective helps remind all of you that you know when I hear someone saying they're just trading the chart and they don't really care about what it is or how it relates to anything else, I cringe just a little bit because I would argue charts are a meaningful and very vital part of a holistic investment process, which includes other things uh, as well. Great take there from uh, from Tony Dwyer. Let's continue today's show with our sector deep dive. What we like to do with some uh, regularity is visit a particular sector, dig in a little deeper, focus on some of the trends and patterns that uh, that are relevant. Uh, we, we've rotated a number of different sectors uh, recently, and I wanted to go to uh, communication services today. I did that because I was looking at the returns today and communication services at the bottom. If I remember right yesterday, I feel like it was the same thing. And one of the challenges you have in the communication services sector is it's actually a very uh, diverse sector. If we go to the industry summary report, and the way you get here on Stock Charts, by the way, if you've not seen it before, it's really, really cool. You go to Charts and Tools in the upper left corner, and on the right side, there's a bunch of things listed. Go to Industry Summary. It's going to look kind of like this. It starts with a chart view, which is a great way of just looking at how some of these uh, how some of these groups are performing. But if you click on table view, which is what I like to do, because then you can resort the table based on different things. You can see what's up or down on a given day, and it defaults to showing you today's returns to see what groups within the communication services or consumer discretionary, or whatever, how they're doing. But you can also sort, uh, sort them by the scooter ranking, which is what we're going to do. This basically, we rank all the 106 Dow industry groups that we have on our platform, rank them in order of their technical strength, right? Their trend strength from 99.9 .9 is the strongest group, which you can see here is uh, automobiles within the consumer discretionary sector. That's Tesla, um, Ford, GM, all in that group. And then it goes all the way to uh, 0.1, uh, which would be the, uh, the weakest uh, group out of, the, uh, out of the entire list. So this shows us strength to weakness within the communication services sector. It's a great way of just looking at the different businesses that are represented. You have to remember communication services used to be a number of different sectors. It used to be the old telecom sector, which is fixed line telecommunications for the most part. That's AT&T and Verizon, sort of like the old Ma Bell sort of telephone companies. Uh, then you have uh, a number of different stocks like entertainment, media, uh, internet names that came from technology and consumer discretionary, and they basically mashed those up a couple of years ago and turned it into communication services, which recognizes the fact that, you know, AT&T is not just, you know, your, your landline, if any of you still have one of those, um, but also, you know, uh, obviously mobile and, and all the other things that they're uh, 5G and all the other themes as well. So it's a great way of uh, reflecting the, the modern uh, sector distribution and where they should be. But within communication services, you have uh, publishing, which would be things like um, what is in here, FactSet, Thomson Reuters, um, you know, FDS, TRI. I'm thinking of the market data providers that I think are, are in there. Um, you have internet names, um, uh, which would be like Alphabet and others, mobile telecoms, things like T-Mobile, broadcasting entertainment, that would be things like Disney and Comcast and others, media agencies, which is a smaller group, and then fixed line telecoms. We'll start there. And what I'm going to do is just jump around some of these. From that report, you can drill down to each group and look in a little more detail and see the individual names that make it up. But I'm just going to jump around given the limited time and focus on some of the names that, uh, that have caught my eye. As I reviewed earlier today, I was screening for... Uh, for my market misbehavior premium members, new highs, new lows. It's a regular weekly screen that I run. Then I review a number of the, a number of the charts. And here are a couple that caught my eye this, uh, this morning. You know, at t is a really challenging chart. We've talked about this and I, and I mentioned it is a bottom fishing idea. And, and, and here's the thing. Bottom fishing ideas are not my favorite. That is when you buy something incredibly weak. It, I get the idea of it. I get the idea of buying very low and selling very high. Theoretically, that makes sense. But I have spent way too much time with growth-oriented investors that want to see signs of accumulation. I've worked for portfolio managers that would much rather buy stocks that are in an uptrend than in a downtrend. So I've learned to avoid these types of charts. However, I think it's worth highlighting when things uh, you know, hit or they're so bombed out that you look like there could be an opportunity. So the challenge with that sort of falling knife approach is you have to manage your risk. You have to have a stop in place. And 
you know, Tom DeMarc, who I, I used to work with often in my Bloomberg days, and I you know, got very familiar with his methodologies, you know, is a very contrarian approach to buying weakness and selling strength, but it also has a built-in risk assessment, right? So there's a, oh, it's called a TD risk level that's built in. So you have a buy signal and you have a, an automatic stopping point based on volatility. And so AT&T has basically violated that and has accelerated to the downside. The reason why it's an interesting chart to highlight is based on its dividend, which has remained relatively stable, it's yielding over 9% because the price has come down. Basically, the, yield, the dividends remain the same, but it's six months later, it's about a two thirds of the, of the price that it was back there. It's lost about a third of, his, of its value. So very compelling from an income point of view, but, but challenging certainly uh, looking at the, uh, at the price chart. We also have to talk about things like Facebook, uh, and Alphabet, let's get to those next. You know, Facebook certainly uh, felt some pain today. Uh, I should start calling this meta at some point. I don't know if I'm emotionally ready, but I'll try. Down 4% today, so underperforming the S&P overall. But this is what concerns me more about today's sell-off. Number one, the fact that we made a lower high in mid-November, right? So we made the uh, new all-time high in, uh, in July, again in September, pulled back to the 200-day moving average, rotated back above the 50-day. This is the time when it felt like it may actually be returning to previous highs. From there, though, it's stalled, and now it's broken back down through the 200-day moving average. It's testing support at 310, and I think that's a key first level to look at. The other level I'll be looking at is back here, the April-May uh, lows. I think that lines up pretty well with the 38.2% uh, retracement is around 290 to 300. So we're getting uh, very close to the previous swing low after making a lower high. The RSI did not get above 60 on that last attempt to get higher. Overall, that is a chart in distribution mode, testing a new six plus month relative low. And overall, that's a, that's a, a chart show, certainly showing some weakness. So again, this chart can, find, uh, can stabilize and eventually rotate higher, but it just tells me tactically right now, it's not a great time to be looking at that as a potential opportunity, given the weakness that you've seen. We've uh, certainly, I, I think, uh, very familiar with the, uh, in the internet space, the video game names, EA, Activision. Activision was one of the worst uh, charts in there. And it looks like a lot of the media charts, which we'll talk about. I think Activision is a really good illustration. If you want to print out a chart and hang it near your desk, hang it in your office as a reminder of what a chart in distribution mode looks like. This might be a good example. And, and unfortunately, communication services, there are a lot of them. Disney is another good example. Viacom, Comcast, Discovery, all are decent examples of this. But look at how this stock uh, was in the first quarter of this year, making new all-time highs, strong upside momentum, making new or testing new relative highs. Look at how that changed, right? And over the summer, you had a lower high, a series of lower highs, a series of lower lows, breaking down through both of the moving averages, the momentum remaining in the bearish phase below 60. And now we're below two downward sloping moving averages as we continue to make new relative lows. That is a chart in distribution mode. And when I look at cross communication services, I'm finding a lot of them. I mentioned some of those uh, charts and we didn't even get to things like Spotify or Twitter or uh, ZI or T-Mobile or Zillow Group or uh, uh, Match.com, but all of those similarly breaking down. Communication services is a tough sector. If you if you need to be there for some reason, I would be focusing on the charts that are working. And three that I'll highlight: FDS, FactSet, TRI, which is Thomson Reuters, not too far off of uh, off of all time highs. Alphabet still uh, a fairly strong chart in a struggling market. We need to wrap the show quickly, go to the three and three. It's more like the three and one today. Here we go. Chart number one is the S&P 500. I reminded you 4550. I've said it so many times and we've arrived there. So what I'll be looking for through the remainder of this week is validation confirmation by following through to the downside and undercutting today's low. But overall, I would say a high likelihood we get to S&P 4300, which would be the next downside objective based on this trajectory. That'd be an 8%, 9% drop from all-time highs. Worth noting this bearish momentum divergence that appears to be playing out through the course of the last week. Chart number two, American Airlines, ticker AAL. This represents a lot of travel, tourism uh, theme names, hotels, airlines, uh, a lot of things breaking down, gambling stocks, but AAL and the other airlines are really struggling. And they, they had a clear support level. They've all broken them. This is the Fibonacci level, which lined up with the previous lows. We now bounced off the 50% 50, uh, 50 and broken. 15 is the next downside objective given the, uh, the trajectory. But the third chart reminds you that it's not all lost. There are sectors that are, that are working and groups that are working. I think it's the ASH trade, A-S-H, Apple, semiconductors, and home builders. Apple making new highs, uh, semiconductors making new highs, home builders very close to doing so. And a number of those on the, uh, on the top 10 list, given their overall strength, not a bad uh, group of stocks to be focusing on. 
Folks, that is our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to Tony Dwyer from Canaccord Genuity as well. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.